What's going on everybody? Welcome to another video on my channel. Today we talk about Spark Performance Bottleneck. And one of the most important things to consider when we're talking about Spark Performance is Data Skew. I have prepared a small Jupyter notebook here where I would like to demonstrate how to detect Data Skew in the query executions and how the query would perform differently if the data wasn't skewed. Now I'm excited. Let's get into it. All right, so here's the notebook I have prepared. I've simply started a Jupyter notebook um, in a Docker container, and then I have created a small example here. So first of all, I'm going to import the essentials. Then I'm going to instantiate a Spark session, and we're going to disable AQE for now. So we don't use the adaptive query execution, which has some basically runtime statistic based performance optimizations for us. And we're going to set the executor memory to one gigabyte. We are going to have um, eight executor threads here, just for your information. And I have generated two data sets, the one being uh, the transaction data set, which has a very high skew in the instrument ID. So you can think of the semantics of this data as being transactions as they might occur in a stock exchange, for example. And each tra transaction has a timestamp. It's, it's trading one instrument. There is a trader ID and some of these things. The second data set is the transactions uniform or transaction uniform, where we basically have a uniform um, distribution of instrument IDs. Now, the highly skewed data set is likely to occur in real world data sets as well. And the most important thing you have to do probably as a Spark developer is to be aware of the traits of your data. Now you should have a look at what, how is your data distributed. And what we're going to do here in the next cell is basically that we group by instrument ID, then we count and we also want to see the, the largest basically instrument ID groups. And we, we're doing the same thing for the uniform transaction data frame. And then we will get a result showing only 20 rows, the top 20 rows. And this takes a while. So each of these data sets has 10 million rows, each row being approximately 20 bytes because we have one um, date time field. And then we have so that would be eight bytes. And then we have three integers, each of them having four bytes. So each row is around about 20 bytes. Now for the skewed data set, we can see that there are actually only 10 distinct instrument IDs. And um, still the data set is partitioned into 200 partitions. And we can see that it's like largely skewed. So the largest, the largest instrument ID has almost 4 million of the 10 million transactions. And the second largest instrument has also almost 4 million transactions. And then, so the smallest, the smallest group here has only 4,000 records. So that's what is considered a data skew with respect to the instrument ID column. Secondly, here is the basically histogram of our uniformly distributed data set. And here we have many more instrument IDs and each of them having approximately the same size, actually. So that's the, how do you say, the statistics or the traits of the data we are looking at. All right. Um, additionally, I have now implemented a small functionality here, which I have encapsulated into a, a function, which is called expensive transformation. And what we do is we use a window function. We partition by instrument ID. And as we know already that we are dealing with highly skewed data with respect to the column instrument ID, whenever we write code like this, we should be very careful. So we should think carefully if that makes a lot of sense. However, in this case, let's say this is the requirement. So we partition by instrument ID and then we order by the transaction timestamp. So what we get is basically a data frame, which is grouped into instrument ID windows and within each of the windows, it's sorted by transaction TS, so timestamp. And basically this statement is not per se non-optimizable or not or very expensive because it also depends on the, on the window function we use later on, whether this could be optimized 
or not. And we will understand why this is actually very expensive to calculate if we use it together with the lag function. Now what we do is we take the input data frame and we create a new column lag date which will basically pull the transaction TS from the previous row into the current row and if there is no previous row it uses the default timestamp which is simply set to the 1st of January 2023 and we do that over the window specification. Now if we think about it Spark has to basically group our data frame into windows where all records have the same instrument ID, then sort it by the transaction timestamp. And we need the sorting to be exact because we always want to see the previous day's transaction timestamp in the current row. So we cannot use any partial sorting if that is a term to you but we actually have to get all of the records for one instrument ID into one partition, which will make this a very, very exp expensive transformation. And that was actually the intention of writing the code like this. I wanted it to be um, yeah, almost not optimizable so that we can detect or that we can see how we can detect data skew during the execution. If you are looking to become a professional Spark engineer, and Spark is actually one of the most important skills for every data engineer, I would recommend you to visit my academy, which you can find at academy.philipp-bronenberg.de. Now, I offer individual coachings where we work together for 12 weeks in one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions, and I will teach you everything you have to know to get your job in data engineering as a Spark developer. I have 10 years of experience as a freelance data engineer and i have created this courses and this resources to help you learn spark there are some video courses for example an extensive video course on spark internals but as i said before there's also a getting started with PySpark video course and the individual coaching program which i'm always happy to tell you more about in a private call so if you're interested check it out now as i said before i want uh, the uh, adaptive query execution to be disabled. So during the Spark instantiation, we set it to false. So, and now I will simply run this on the, first of all, now let's start with, let's start with the uniform distributed data. And actually we will write the result to a parquet file, which we are never going to use. And we have to do it like that because if we used show, it would, probably find some, some optimization using some limit or something um, to only evaluate the top 20 rows. But I want the I want Spark to actually evaluate the entire data set and therefore I simply write it to Parquet so Spark has to actually come up with all the data. Now if I execute this, it doesn't work because I haven't executed this cell. All right, so now it's running, we can see it and I can head over to the Spark web UI, where we can see what's going on. So now we can see that there are some completed jobs, which have rem uh, the show statements and the parquet read statements. And here we can see that our query is now executing. Now, if I go to SQL data frame, we can see actually what's going on. So this is the parquet action because it's triggered by the parquet. And here we can see the query plan that's being executed. So first of all, we have a scan parquet. We have 200 partitions and um, there's a scan time and so on. There's also the sizes being reported of the files read. And then we do already an exchange, which basically just redistributes data with respect to the instrument ID. And here we can see, for example, some shuffle bytes written. So in total, it has written 176 megabytes whatever, that's what's happening. So we redistribute by instrument ID, we sort and we apply the window function and so on. Let's go back to the jobs here. It has completed now, it took 34 seconds. So this statement has actually two stages. One took seven seconds. So here we were loading the data in, in eight tasks. So that is fine. So that would always be uniformly distributed because our data on disk is uniformly distributed. Here we can see the task um, execution times and they are pretty much yeah, even. 
So the yellow boxes are the serialization time and the green boxes are the actual execution time. Um, let's go back and look at the other stage, which is more interesting. Let me see, was it that one? Yes, it was that, it was that one. All right, let's go down here and look at the tasks. Now here we can see we have some slightly different task execution times, um, which we can tell from these boxes here. Um, in the overview section, we can see that the shuffle read size and the number of records, here we can see the min 25th percentile, median 75th percentile and max, they are pretty much even. So here we have 30,000 and here we have 72,000, which is not so much of a difference. We can see it in the task execution times that we have basically a, how do you say, variance like this. And we cannot detect any disk spill here. So overall, the execution looks fine. I cannot detect anything telling me that something's terrible going on. Um, however, if I run the same now with the highly skewed data frame, the situation will look quite different. So it's executing now. Let's head over and refresh. So here's our new stage. It's still running. So three tasks are still running, which already indicates that we have some skew. So two tasks are very long running tasks and it's still running. So 24 seconds. So there are two stages again. Let's look at the basically the window stage again. We are not looking at the um, reading stage, which is always pretty much the same. So here we can see also quite even. So each of the partition has 1.25 million rows, which makes total sense because because that's actually exactly one eighth of 10 million. So these partitions are very even. Let's go back to stages and look at the window stage. Now here, that is data skew. So here we have one task which runs extremely long. It ran for 22 seconds. And the second longest task ran for 10 seconds. And now if we look at the overview here, we can, first of all, we can detect some disk spill. So most of the task, tasks don't have any disk spill. But the max tasks, so the task with, with the largest disk spill has 83 megabytes. And that's actually something we would like to avoid because that's extremely expensive. That happens if the large partition doesn't fit into the executor memory. And as you may recall, we have set the executor memory to be one gigabyte, which leaves us with around about 400 megabytes for execution only. And obviously the largest partition containing of 4 million records actually doesn't fit into the memory. So we have to serialize the data, write it to disk, later on access it from disk and deserialize it, all of which are expensive operations requiring also CPU time and also access to the slow disk and compared to the memory, so the main memory. So that's what we can detect here. And also a very important statistic here is most, so the, the uh, shuffle read size, so the, the number of records each of the task has read from the previous stage, so from the um, uniformly distributed non-grouped input data, one of the partitions has read the vast amount of data here. And we can see this here in the shuffle read size, this one, it's sorted uh, descending. So the largest task has, has to read uh, 4 million records and so on, basically like the distribution in our data. And here we can see we only have 10 keys. So only 10 keys are actually, or only 10 tasks are actually running, but we, we see 200 tasks, um, which are basically not doing anything because there's no data in the partition. And this 200 tasks in the shuffle stage um, basically in the result stage comes from Spark's default configuration of default, uh, so number of default shuffle partitions. Okay, so we have detected data skew and we have understood that it leads 
to disk spill, which is very expensive. Now, I want to show you one more thing. If I enabled AQE now and ran this query again on the skewed data, what would you think does happen? So there are a couple of optimizations that AQE introduces, one of them being the optimization of shuffle partitions. And it also has some implementation of salting, so splitting up large skewed partitions. However, salting is not at all applicable here in an automatic way. That's simply because of the way this query has been written. So we actually need to redistribute all the keys. Um, we, ought, we actually have to get all of the records for one key into one partition so that we can sort on the transaction timestamp and then apply our lag function. If we wanted to do this in a salting kind of way, we would have to write a lot of custom code and be very cautious about what we are implementing there. So, all right, so the query has completed. Let's go back to the jobs and see what's happening. Now, first of all, we can notice, so these two jobs here belong together. They have been triggered at 10 and 26. The first one is, as usual, the same. Uh, let's like, look at the second one, and um, where we can see that we only have, what do we have, four tasks only. Let's look at the stages. So the first one still has eight tasks, but the second one, instead of 200, as we had it here, only has four tasks now, which gives us a performance improvement. Um, and here we can see, okay, we still have very skewed data, um, so skewed data in the tasks. And if we look at the overview here, we still see some um, disk spill, which is not surprising because the largest partition won't become smaller be just because we have less um, sh shuffle input partitions. But so the disk spill remains the same. The only thing we save is basically uh, scheduler delay, scheduler overhead. We have um, much less tasks which have to be serialized, scheduled, executed, and deserialized, and so and these things. So the the actual execution of the query doesn't really improve, but we save a lot of overhead. And we can see here that many of these small partitions have been combined into one partition here, which makes a lot of sense because they were so small anyway. So the execution time for this one, can we see it here? Duration here. So all of these small partitions combined took like three seconds, um, but the largest partition took six, uh, 17 seconds. So 17 seconds, as this is not automatically optimizable, is basically the critical path in our program. So actually, we could have combined this and this partition into one large partition and we wouldn't have gained anything but we wouldn't have lost anything because one task will run for 17 seconds. So I hope this helped you to understand a bit what data skew actually is and how you can detect it in your Spark program. So the key takeaway for you would be to actually know the data, get some statistics, look at the distribution of keys so that you can be cautious about statements like this where you say partition by instrument ID if you know that your data is highly skewed on this instrument ID. You should give it some thought if it's optimizable and if not or in any case you should use the Spark Web UI to watch out for the important metrics which will be the task execution times and the number of records um, processed by each of the tasks if these, if these are highly skewed. I hope you have enjoyed this video. If you have some questions Leave them in the comments. I always try to ask them quickly. And also, if you enjoy this video, please hit the like button or subscribe to this channel. I hope to see you next time for the next video. Until then, bye-bye.